Hello, everyone. We are going to continue our discussion in Chapter 10 of Intermediate Accounting. So today we are going to start out talking about intangible assets. So these are assets that, again, are long lived. So they're going to last well over a year and they are revenue earning. They are going to bring us in revenue in some way or another. So these intangible assets represent exclusive rights that provide benefits to the owner. So we're going to talk about some of these different intangible assets and how they can benefit the company, the owner of these assets. They are intangible, so they lack physical substance. You can't touch them or feel them or see them, but they are something of value. They are difficult to anticipate the timing and the existence of future benefit that's attributable to many intangible assets. So we have to make an educated guess here. We have to make an educated estimate as to how long they're going to last and what kind of benefits they're going to bring in. But it can be difficult to determine that. So companies either would purchase these intangible assets from another entity. So maybe there's a patent that another company already owns and you're buying it from them or a copyright or a trademark, something that another company has you're buying from them. Or they may develop these intangible assets internally. So they may have developed a new product and they are getting that product um, patented or they have their own literature that they're going to have a copyright on or whatever it may be. It may be developed internally. So these intangible assets are either going to have a finite useful life, so we know approximately how long they're going to last, or at least we know that they're not going to last forever. In that case, we have to make an estimate as to how long they last, and we would amortize that asset over a period of years, uh, you know, several years. So amortize is basically the same concept as depreciation. If they have indefinite useful lives, so we think that it's gonna bring us value for as long as this company is around, then we would not amortize it. We don't think that the value is going to go away over time. So we would keep that cost as the number represented on the balance sheet indefinitely. So the amount we're gonna see on the balance sheet, we've got the purchase price, plus all the other necessary costs that's going to bring the asset to its desired condition and location. So it's about the same with the PP&E. We are going to include all of those amounts that we have to pay up front in order to get this asset as something that is going to bring us value. That is the cost that we are initially going to recognize on the balance sheet. This looks like a lot of information here, but it's good information. So let's cover some of this. These are some really popular intangible assets that you will see on the balance sheet. Patents, that's the right to manufacture a product or to use a process. So if you came up with, let's say, those shoes, Heelys, um, I think that's what they're called, where you they have little wheels on the bottom. You may have seen those. A long time ago and I think they made a comeback not too long ago so you're walking around looks like you're just wearing tennis shoes around the mall and then you're able to pop out these wheels from the bottom of your shoes well that process of making that or maybe the mold of making those shoes I'm sure that company had a patent on it so that other companies could not copy their exact design patents are granted for 20 years, meaning for 20 years, nobody can manufacture your exact product or process or whatever you have the patent on. That doesn't necessarily mean that your company expects for it to bring in revenue for 20 years. So that's something that you have to consider. You know, is this going to be a novelty thing like a fidget spinner that is only popular for, let's just say a year or two? Or do we think it's going to last the full 20 years? So that's something that you want to make an educated 
estimate at in the beginning. The cost that you are going to incur for those patents that you can capitalize are gonna be the purchase price and all the legal fees, filing fees that would be included. You would not include internal research and development. We will talk about research and development a lot later on in chapter 10. Another intangible asset you'll see a lot is copyrights. It's the right of protection given to a creator of a published work. So if you have a book you wrote or a song or a film, then you would have a copyright so someone cannot copy that exact same work. Those are granted for life of the creator plus 70 years. So nobody can copy that for the whole life of the, the person or company who made it plus another 70 years. So that obviously is um, an intangible asset of value. Nobody can copy your same work. So again, that cost is gonna include the price, any legal fees, filing fees, and just like the patent, you can't include internal research and development. Trademarks are another intangible asset. That's the right to display a word, a slogan, a symbol, or an emblem. So, you know, we think about the big, the two arches, you know, or the golden arches, the McDonald's M, right? That's not something that you can go out and open a restaurant. You cannot put those golden arches out front because that is their trademark. That is McDonald's trademark. You cannot use the slogan, eat fresh for your restaurant. That's Subway's, that is their slogan. They have a trademark on that. You register your trademarks with the US Patent Office for a period of 10 years. So for 10 years, they cannot copy that. And I'm sure that can be renewed. Same types of costs that can be included, purchase price, legal fees, filing, and you cannot include the research and development internally. And then there's also franchises. That is the exclusive right by a franchisor to a franchisee to use the franchisor's trademark or product. So this is where a company says, you know, we've got a good idea here, Chick-fil-A. They say we've got a good idea and we would like to be able to allow other people to open Chick-fil-A's. They would have the same menu, they would have the same trademarks, the same slogans, everything, but they would have to pay us a fee for that. That's going to be an intangible asset, those franchises. So the franchisor grants it for a specified period of time to the franchisee. You can buy into Chick-fil-A, you can open your own as long as you meet all these parameters and they may have a specified time that they can do that. So in the franchise assets, we would include the initial payment plus periodic payments over the life of the franchise agreement. So you may have to pay a million dollars up front to open a Chick-fil-A and then continue to pay a fee every year, those would be part of the cost that's recognized on the balance sheet, plus any legal costs associated with that contract. So that's a lot of information, but it's all really good information to know what we are talking about with intangible assets. Okay, another intangible asset is goodwill. We are not talking about the thrift store. You know, I think I'm a big fan of buying things at a thrift store. You get a huge discount, but that is not what we are talking about here. When we talk about goodwill, we are talking about the extra money a company spends when they buy another company on top of the price of their assets because they have clientele and a reputation. Maybe the company has trained employees and management teams, they have to pay a premium for that, or they just have a favorable business location. So in other words, maybe the company has their building, they have their um, machines, they have their land, and let's say those are all valued at a million dollars. A company buys them for one and a half million that extra 500,000 would be considered goodwill. Why did they pay extra for that company more than the building, more than the land? Because they maybe had 
a lot of clientele that they are also going to get throughout that purchase. Maybe they have an awesome reputation that the company worked really hard on. It's not something that is tangible, but it's something that was of value that the company purchasing the other company, the existing company, um, they are able to sell it at a premium. So the difference is going to be goodwill. So here's kind of the calculation we would use for that. We say the fair value of the consideration exchanged, so the acquisition price for the company, minus the fair value of the net assets acquired. So the, the fair value of the company that we're, we're paying for the company minus the actual assets we're getting. The difference between those is goodwill. What are we talking about when we say the fair value of the net assets? That's the fair value of all identifiable, tangible, and intangible assets minus the fair value of any liabilities of the company that's uh, selling their company. Okay, so the second part of that problem, the fair value of the net assets acquired, you're taking all of the tangible and intangible assets that the company has minus any liabilities that's gonna be the fair value of the net assets acquired. The amount you're subtracting it from is the amount that the actual company is worth. Again, it may be worth a lot more, may have a much higher fair value because of the clientele they have, the reputation, the employees, whatever, the, the great name, let's say it's Coca-Cola. If you bought Coca-Cola today, you are not just gonna be paying for their physical assets or even their intangible assets. You're going to pay a premium for the reputation that Coca-Cola has. And that's goodwill. So let's look at an example. The Smithson Corporation acquired all of the outstanding common stock of the Ryder Corporation in exchange for $180 million cash. Smithson assumed all of Ryder's long-term liabilities which have a fair value of 120 million at the date of acquisition. The fair values of all identif identifiable assets of Ryder are receivables of 50 million, inventory of 70 million, PP&E of 90 million, and a patent, patent of 40 million. So what's the cost of goodwill resulting from this acquisition? So first we say, what was the amount that they paid for it? They paid 180 million cash. So we're gonna subtract out the net value, the net fair value of the assets they acquire. So that's gonna be all of the identifiable assets minus the liabilities. So we have the 180 million, the amount we're paying for it. We add up all of those assets we were able to identify the 50 million in receivables, 70 million in inventory, 90 million in equipment, and 40 million in patent, those equal 250 million. Then we're gonna subtract out the liabilities that this new Smithson company is going to acquire. So they had 120 million of liabilities. So we take the 250 million of assets, subtract out the 120 million of liabilities, that tells us that we have 130 million of net fair value assets that they're acquiring. So we subtract the 130 million from the fair value that we are paying for this exchange of 180. The difference between the two are goodwill. We paid 50 million extra to get Ryder Corporation. That 50 million is paying maybe for their reputation, for their employees, whatever it may be, we value them at 50 million more than their net assets, and we are gonna consider that goodwill. That will be recognized on Smithson's balance sheet under the assets. So this is gonna be what the journal entry would look like. We now have 50 million of receivables we've added to Smithson Company. We have inventory increase of 70 million, PP&E of 90 million, and um, a patent of 40 million. We also incurred 
the 120 of liabilities. So we're going to put that on the credit side and we got rid of 180 million in cash. What's the difference? The 50 million in goodwill. So that would make our entry balance and that's going to be the correct entry to recognize goodwill. All right, let's do a little concept check here. The Dearden Golf Ball Company acquired all of the outstanding common stock of Sanderson Golf for $1,750,000. The book values of and fair values of the Sanderson's assets and liabilities on the date of purchase were as follows. And then it's going to ask us how much goodwill should they record? All right, so the first question when we look at this is what? Do we use the book value or the fair value? Well, remember it's the fair value of the net assets that we're gonna be using. So we don't care what their book value is. Book value is subtracting out their, um, their amortization, their accumulated depreciation. So we don't care what their book value is. We wanna know the fair value. So we're gonna take the current assets of 415,000 plus the property plant and equipment fair value of 1,470,000. Then we're gonna subtract out the 300,000 of liabilities. The difference between that and the 1,750 we paid for the company is gonna be our goodwill. So that was $165,000. Again, we took our fair value amounts of current assets plus property plant and equipment assets subtracted out our liabilities. Then we took that number and subtracted it from the amount that they acquired Sanderson Golf for. The difference between the two is goodwill. All right, we're also gonna look at lump sum purchases. So lump sum for purchases refers to the acquisition of a group of assets for a single sum, okay? so. I'm gonna buy this whole company, I'm gonna buy all their assets for X amount of dollars. And it's gonna have all kinds of different things in it or it may have identical items in it that I just bought. So if you have a bunch of assets that are identical, like in this first example, we have 10 identical delivery trucks purchased for a lump sum of $150,000. How much would we recognize as an asset for delivery trucks? We'd put the whole 115,000, right? They would be, we'd take the 150,000 divided by 10. We know that they are valued at 15,000 a piece. So on our, our balance sheet, we would see an asset of delivery trucks for the full 150,000. Simple. But what if we have a lump sum purchase but we're getting lots of different kinds of assets that have different useful lives. Maybe we have computers that last for three years. We have trucks that last for five years. We have a building that lasts for 30 years. We need to figure out how to break those out. So in this example, the acquisition of a factory that includes assets that are significantly different, such as land, building, and equipment. So you've got all different kinds that you bought of assets that you bought for one lump sum purchase. So we're gonna allocate the lump sum acquisition price among the separate items. So let's look at an example. We have the Smith Hand and Edge Tool Company purchased an existing factory for a single lump sum of $2 million. The price included the title to the land, the factory building, the equipment, in the building and the patent on a process that the equipment uses and then their inventory of raw materials. An independent appraisal estimated the fair value of the assets if they would have been purchased separately. So we have each of the assets they bought listed out here and then they got a, a professional independent appraiser to give what they thought the fair value of each of those individual items would be. When you add them all up, they equaled $2.2 million. Well, we only paid $2 million, so we must have gotten a discount for that. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out what percentage each individual asset is of the total amount, and that's how we're going to allocate them. So for land here, we take the 330,000 divided by the total 2.2 million. You see that equation right here. That gives us 15%. So the land was 15% of the purchase price. We're going to do that for each individual item. So our building is 550,000 divided by 2.2 million. That tells us our building is 25% of the total purchase price. We did that for each item to get the percentages. It's always important to do a check and make sure your total is 100%, which it is. So awesome, we can move forward. So remember, we've broken them out to figure out the percentages that each line item is of the total appraised amount. So then we are going to take that $2 million we actually paid for it, we got that discount, and then we're going to multiply each individual line item by the percentages we already calculated to tell us how much we're going to allocate to each individual asset. So let's walk through a couple of them. So we paid $2 million total for all the assets, but we want to know how much each one is individually worth. So we took $2 million times 15% for the land because we already calculated the land was 15% of the purchase price. So 2 million times 15% or times 0 0.15 is 300,000. So that the land would now show a cost of 300,000 on the balance sheet. For the building, we took $2 million times 0 0.25, 25%. That gave us 500,000 because 25% of 2 million was, is 500,000. So we do that for each item, and that tells us how much each item should be valued at on the balance sheet. So again, we can do a check to make sure that if we add all of those individual valuations, they would equal the total purchase price of $2 million. So the journal entry for that would look like this. We would debit because we are increasing asset accounts. We would debit our land for the amount we calculated above, debit our building for the 500,000 we calculated, and so on. Then we would credit our cash for the full 2 million because we are decreasing cash as an asset. All right. I think we are going to stop right there for this lesson, and next time we will talk about non-cash acquisitions.